Welcome back to the Millennial Dentist Podcast, a podcast all about working smarter, not harder. Pushing dentists to go beyond dental school dentistry and build the practice of your dreams. Here is your host, the Millennial Dentist himself, Dr. Sully Sullivan. All right, welcome back to new and improved, rebranded Millennial Dentist Podcast. Hope you're having a great day. I just got off on a mastermind call with one of the um, one of our docs that's in our continuing program, and we were talking about, you know, how do you manage the associate that you know is growing, is being successful? You're starting to diagnose more. They're getting busier, and they're getting a taste of you know success. And how do you how do you handle that growth? You know, because there's there's kind of two ways I look at things. One is is that like you have to your office as the owner has to maintain a standard of care that you accept and you're happy with, right? I mean, you can't you can't drop that ball. The sec- so that's part of it. One is is like there's this there's a hesitation into associates growing or doing more in that are they going to drop below the standard of care what the office wants? That's problem number one. Problem number two is that if they keep growing, on some level, they become a threat to the owner or it, it feels like it's a threat to the owner of doing what they want to do more of and then potentially the, the production and, and, and messing up with their income. And so that becomes a challenge. So I think it's good for both, both parties to understand that is that for a lot of dentist associate relationships, there's a hesitancy in the associate growing because it it feels like the potential threat to the owning doctor. Now, look, I take a total different approach on this, and it's kind of what we'll get into talking about in this episode. But my thing is, is at the end of the day, I want to feed the associate first. Um, and that's kind of my my overarching theme of this conversation is that I know that and I, and I have to make the assumption like that the dentist is doing good clinical work. If the dentist isn't doing good clinical work, then we're going to we're going to have to have a conversation of like you don't get to level up until you're doing good quality work. But if they're doing good quality work, then, then we can't just necessarily hold them back from progressing. Because if you do that, you know what's going to happen, right? That the, they're going to leave. And I think this is what we see is a lot of dentists. What happens is the challenge is that the, the young doctor comes in. They're hungry, they're getting going, they're starting to do well, and then their their growth or the expedience of their growth is scary to the doctor because one, they worry about the quality care dropping, and two, it cutting into their pie. Remember, they they thought like, oh, this associate was going to come in and take away a lot of the general dentistry so I could go on and do other things. Now, the the um, let's kind of get into the challenges of this. So challenge number one is that the, um, we're going to outline what it is that it takes to do, to do a procedure in our office. So we're going to, I'm going to use dental implants because I think that's a popular one that, you know, associate comes in, they do a lot of the bread and butter dentistry and they want to start to level up. And so they want to do dental implants. So in our office, you come to me and say, Hey, I've been here for a year. Things are going well. I'd like to start doing dental implants. So the next question is going to be, well, where are we going to get trained? And in our office, obviously, we're going to go to 3D dentists, do go through the digital implant continuum because we're going to teach guided surgery from the beginning. So I would say, no problem. Let's look at when the next available course is and let's get you signed up because that's going to be the stepping stone to doing it. At that point, they're going to take the course. We'll see how they do. They're going to get live patient you know, training. They're going to get to do some patients, place some implants. And at that point, then we'll oversee their implants and they'll place green light cases for the time being. That would be kind of how I would let them do it. Now, the fear there is that one, if they start doing single implants, well, then maybe I'm doing single implants. And so my thing is, is like that my challenge to the owning doc is like, you've got to level up and you could level up in one of two ways. The first way is that you could level up on a procedural basis, meaning that at some point, single green light implants is beneath you, or it's dental school dentistry to you, or it's, 
it's something that is once it can be reproducible by somebody else in office, it's time to move on to do two other things. That's one option. The other option is that you start to work more on developing your business versus developing your, uh, you know, your clinical, I call it your clinical monkeyness, but you know, and what I mean by that is that like, essentially we're just a monkey that's a highly trained monkey that does dentistry. And so for a lot of us, that's how we're paid. You know, we make all our money based off being highly trained employees when really we don't make much money as a business owner. So option one is you continue to elevate your clinical skill set. I think that's a good option. And option two is you work on your business. So your business makes more money. It becomes more profitable and spits out more money for you as an owner and not as the employee. And the answer probably is that it's somewhere in between, right? I mean, it's both. I go to learn maybe more advanced bone grafting, overdentures all in X, sinus lift, something like that to progress my clinical skill set. But meanwhile, I get to step back in growing my business because at the end of the day, your associate should be in a well-run business. You should be making as an owner five to 10% off, uh, you know, off them. Now, associate, that's something for you to think about too. Okay. So it's not like they're just, it's good to understand that like, there just isn't gravy money just getting poured out from the dentistry that you're doing necessarily. Now it's good. It's, it's better. You know I mean? You're making money. Hopefully that's the idea. And the beauty of it is you don't have to carry any of the costs. So it ends up being a very win, win, win because you are impro- improving your clinical skill set. And when you, when you aren't making money as an owner, you've got to make money then by doing that. And that comes at a trade off without all the headache and other, you know, BS that owning has to deal with. So those are kind of the two things that we have to look at is like, okay, once, once they get going, how am I going to uh, feed them first? Because if, I, if I'm fearful that my production will drop, and that's an income problem, right? Is trying to figure out, okay, well, if I, if I give away all my single implants and that, let's say that's, let's just do easy, some easy, let's say it's 25 implants a year, 25 implants, we'll just do it, call it $4,000 for the whole thing. That's $100,000. So that's $100,000 in, in production that I'm going to be giving away to my associate, which means if I, if I want to not offset my money that I'm losing from a clinical perspective, I've got to replace that $100,000. Now, really what that is, is it's a net income of about 30 to 35 grand, right? Because if you're paying yourself as an associate, that's 30 to 35% of adjusted production. Again, owner, if you're paying yourself as an associate, based off $100,000, that's a thirty to thirty-five thousand dollar over the year income that we're, we're potentially losing by not replacing that income. <clears throat> but you're not really truly losing that, are you? Because if you're making ten percent on what they do, then ten percent on that hundred grand means that you're only actually missing your net. Your, it was a twenty-five thousand dollars in net income that you're losing. So if you start to do the math, you realize that like it's not giving the dentistry away is not the end of the world. And then how much time does that buy me back? Now that 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 obviously that time can be bought back on working on the business or improving my my clinical skill set. Because then all of a sudden, instead of placing 25 implants, you know, you 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 learn to do a fixed hybrid, for example. And now all of a sudden you're getting that pay that instead of getting that uh that production in, you know, 20 to 25 people, you're getting that that production in three or four people. So, so it's just food for thought to think about, and it's, it's a challenge that we have a lot of times because, and here's the other part about this. A lot of this is just emotional. It really is. And associates, I want you to appreciate this. Owning docs have, you know, and, and, I, and I think the ones that this is challenging are the, the, the owning docs that have been doing this for... 15 to 30 years. Okay. So they've been doing it 15 to 30 years, busting the butt. They either hung their shingle or they've gone through hard times. They've gone through recessions. They've gone through different points in their life. And then you hear you come in and within a year to 18 months to 24 months, you're wanting to start doing all the flashy stuff that took them 15 years to get there. Am I right owners? And look, my challenge with that is, is like, well, 
as someone who's in the owning position now, is shame on us for if, if for waiting that long to do it. You had every opportunity to move forward. Now, the beauty of this is that you can allow them to move forward even at a faster rate. And guess what? It benefits you. But I think it's important, associates, that you understand that because there's going to be pushback. Because naturally, if I'm in somebody like, and I'll, and I'll take, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll use my dad as an example. You know, dad had been doing this for 25, 30 years. And here I come in within two years wanting to do implants and all this big stuff. And he's like, on some level, well, well, wait a second. I've worked my ass off to do all this. You know, now I have to compete with you on it. And, and he used to always say this to me and he used to drive me crazy. It still drives me crazy if he says that. But he would say, look at where you're at compared to your peers. Like that was supposed to make me feel better that I had progressed faster or further than my peers, but I still wasn't where I wanted to be. Because the timelines of how we succeed is really relative. And so if, if it took, you know, T-Bone will talk about how, well, if it took, whatever it took him 10 years to do, I did it in five years. And I did it in five years because of what I learned from him. And my hope is that what it's taken me to do in five years, someone else can do in two years because of what, you know, they've learned to do it. Assuming that they're willing to put in the work and do it right and do it to a clinical level that you want to do it. So I'm, I'm just warning you, both associates and owning docs, that that's a struggle that you're going to run into is that the associates will always want to progress faster and the owning docs will always want to slow you down. And you also have to respect that that's because, you know, either their name's on the building or their name's on the loan. And so at the end of the day, there's a natural hesitancy that you're not going to get to necessarily progress as fast as they did because they're actually taking on the risk for you progressing at that rate. And yeah, maybe your malpractice at the end of the day, but it's their Google reviews, their name, et cetera. And so my ask would be that like, if you're the associate that you've laid out, that you're willing to listen to the plan of the trajectory of the growth, meaning that you got to go through the CE, you got to go through the reps, you got to do it the way that they want you to do it to prove the concept to earn the right. Like one of the questions he had was, well, she keeps booking this one associate, she keeps booking it, you know, like too much time, not enough time for these bigger cases. And I'm like, and so we have to go back and then move the, move the time or, you know, otherwise I'm like, well, one of two options, one, you could just let her fail once, meaning get behind work through lunch and kind of see what that happens. Or it's your, it's your, again, you're, you're the owner and just saying, Hey, um, we want you to do these cases. That's great. But I want you to book an ample amount of over time until we know that, Hey, this becomes a repeatable thing for you. Right? Like when you come in my practice, to learn, and you're doing your first single crown with Sarah, we're probably going to book you two and a half, three hours. Now, the hope is it doesn't take you that long eventually, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build in buffer until I know that you can do it repeatedly. And even then, you'll probably still set it a two hour block. So we have to think we have to set rules. And then I think the other part of that is then, as, as the owning doctor, is we now have to set, we have to be able to be willing to give that and not be fearful. Because the elephant in the room here is, is that if I don't, make an opportunity for the associate to truly level up, then they leave. Like that's, that's the, that's the reality of the situation. That if I don't give them an opportunity to actually do what they want to do and give them a pathway that's reasonable and timeline to do it, they're going to go somewhere else. That's what I would do. That's what you would do. I mean, there was a point where I told my dad is if you don't let me buy it, I'm leaving. <laughs> and because it's like that, that's what I wanted. Right. And, and, uh, and so if, if, if someone were to tell, if I were to tell my, you know, I'll use Jackson, my associates as an example, if I told him you don't get to place implants. He leaves. And that doesn't help any of us, you know, and sure they could leave afterwards. And, you know, but I, I just, my thing is, is in recapping some of this is that my goal is that I want to feed the associate first. Their schedule should always be the first one to get filled. So the way I look at this is when you look at, if you're a scheduling coordinator, or if you're someone who's, or I'm talking to them about this, I'd say, the way, I, the way that this gets treatment planned to me is if both of us can do it, it should go to the associate. Single crown, associate. Filling, associate. Single implant, associate. If, if it's within their skill set to do it, their schedule should be filled first. Because if one of us has an opening, who can work on the business? I can. And if I work on the business, then 
we become more pro- productive, more profitable. Maybe I learn to do something more. Maybe I can schedule something that's harder for me because now I got more ample time to do it. And the other part of this that's a really important caveat to this is that a feed associate m- model is imperative in a owning or most seasoned doc checks the new patient model approach. And that kind of ties me into the second part of this conversation is that I'm a firm believer that the last thing that should be delegated away is the hygiene checks or is the new, is, is specifically the new patient hygiene checks. You can have the recares. Now, if I'm an associate and you came to my practice and I told you, well, you don't get to check any of the new patients because that's a question they ask, right? Like they're told by consultants and coaches or whatever that like, hey, you should, you should make sure who's going to check the new patients when you get there. Now, what I would tell you is if you come to my practice, you're not going to get to check any of them. But guess what? You're going to have a full schedule. And the logic behind this is that, that to me, the hardest part, the hardest part of dentistry is seeing the dentistry and closing the dentistry. With technology and pre-planning and all the things we can do, I mean, the execution a lot of a lot of the dentistry is just is just fundamentals repeated at scale. I mean, a full mouth rehab is just 28 crowns. There's a lot of pre-planning that goes into it, and that can get really messed up and jacked up. I'm not downplaying that, but I'm saying the fundamental is a crown prep. And so to me, I can set somebody up. I can give them all the diagnostics, all the wax up, all the labs, all the planning to, for them to execute that. I just need them to be able to prep a crown. Now, they need to prep a lot of crowns. That's exhausting. But the hardest part of that is seeing that it needs it, understanding how to diagnose it, to plan it, to, to get it ready, and to ultimately close it. And so if we rely on our and, – and, and look, I'll, I'll give an example. If we rely on the associates to do that, Unfortunately, associates, you're just not you're just not going to see enough dentistry and you're going to miss stuff and we're going to lose opportunity. And I'm telling you, if you're if you're a doctor who's got associates and they're checking all the new patients, you're letting dentistry walk out the door. They wonder why their schedules aren't filled or you wonder why the schedules dropping. And so I I gave you an example. (laughs) I got my buddy. Um. I'll just say his name, Will Jones. <laughs> My buddy Will Jones has a, a, a patient come to me. I don't know it's the, it's his patient. I end up closing twenty five thousand dollars on this patient. It may end up being a little more now. We may do some more stuff, but it's essentially an upper arch of crowns. It's a wear case, um, and this patient had been there, had had a bridge. You know, as far as she, as far as she said, there was no implant really discussed, and the bridge keeps popping off because there's just no clinical crown height, right? I mean, literally nothing, hardly any feral. She's broken it. They put it in zirconia. It doesn't want to stay on. It's just, it's a tough case because it's a wear case. So in my opinion, the, the, the problem with this case was it was underdiagnosed. The, 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 the problem, the perceived problem was a missing tooth that we needed to replace. The real problem was the wear and the collapse, the, low, the, the short clinical crown height, the bite needed to be opened back up. And so I call, and I knew that this wasn't Will because I knew Will placed implants and I knew that he did. So I call Will and I was like, hey, Will, what's up? Uh, I was like, I just closed $25,000 on your patient. And he was like, what? And I go, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't find out after the fact. And, you know, obviously, I don't think they were going to come back anyways at this point. But I want you to know because one, you're my friend. And two, because you're letting dentistry walk out the door because sure enough, one of his associates had checked the patient. And either didn't see it, didn't discuss it appropriately, or something to the fact that the dentistry wasn't done, wasn't treatment planned. There was no, there was never a treatment plan, to, you know, in the notes that talks about full mouth rehab or implants or all this stuff. And so that opportunity was missed. And sure enough, I asked him, I said, who's doing all the new patient checks? He goes, well, we kind of just, it's whoever's available, we divide them up. And so what happens is if we don't feed the associate first, the typical thing that I see is that the owning doc is, and they're not selfish by nature, it just kind of subliminally happens. 
is that they get really busy because now the associates are doing a lot of the grunt work. A lot of associates are probably like, I know how that feels. The challenge there is it backfires on the owning doctor because now they don't have time necessarily treatment plan as much stuff. So they just stay busy. They don't get to work on their businesses. And look, and if I'm making money off my associate, I would rather them keep progressing and doing more. So I'm making more money off their associate. And they're getting more clinical satisfaction. They're working more money. And to me, that's, just, that's, the, that's the traits of a successful relationship from an associate and owning situation. So feeding, feeding the associate first starts with owning senior doctors, checking the majority of new patients or the most, whoever that is, like, I don't know what that looks like, but the doctor that has the most potential to close should be doing it. The doctor that sees the most and it doesn't. Now that doesn't mean that you don't co-treatment plan with your associates, that you don't look at the, that you don't look at, at cases together. But at the end of the day, even if they start to see it, then they got to go communicate it in a way that that gets the patient to say yes. So it's just, that's the hardest part in dentistry. And in my opinion, if you're within your first two or three years out of school, everything that you're doing should be devoted to getting a, increasing your clinical skill set, meaning getting to the point where you just do good quality dentistry. And then it's the owning doctor's job to do the other part of that, which is feed, feed them. And, and feeding them only works if your income is not taking a substantial hit because you're either leveling up or running your business better to where that, that, that income is not being lost. Quickest way to kill an associateship relationship is the owning doctor's income to suffer. If their income starts to suffer, they start to feel threatened. That puts them back into survival mode. That's not going to work. So I do think that owning docs tend to feel threatened and they don't like how fast the associates want to progress. I don't think that's fair. I think the associates, assuming that they're doing good clinical work, should get to progress at a faster rate than you did it. You should help them do it because it benefits you in the long run. And ultimately, the best thing that happened is they could level up to the point that I have to replace them. Not replace them as they're gone, but replace them as they do then more advanced dentistry in the practice. And I got to hire another doctor to now do more of the basic fundamental dentistry. <clears throat> and this becomes a cycle. It's a replacing yourself leveling up cycle. I need my associates to want to level up. It's way easier to find a dental student to get a job than it is to fire an hire an advanced dentist. It's the same thing with dentists. It's the same thing with team members. That's why I'm so, so huge on promoting from within. To take my best hygienist and take her out of hygiene to become a treatment coordinator. To take my best treatment coordinator and run her into running my business. You know, I can always go back and hire a brand new hygienist. I can't just hire some, some treatment coordinator off the street that gets it. So that's kind of teasing probably another episode where we'll talk about it from a team standpoint. But I hope this has been relevant or helpful to both parties involved. That associate, if you could start to focus on the clinical dentistry Get your skill set up and be willing to go through the hoops that your owning doctor sets forth to do good dentistry and to do more advanced dentistry. And then owning, owning doctors, you're willing to sit down and set forth a relative, a, 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 a predictable timeline and success path to doing more of the advanced dentistry that they want to do. And I'll say it very clearly. If, the, if you're not willing to do that, the associate is going to leave and should leave. They should find a place where they're going to be supported to help them grow and succeed. And if, and if you don't have, if you live in a scarcity mindset that you don't think there's enough of that advanced dentistry to go around, then you, you're, you're missing the boat already. Nothing would make me happier than to have one of my associates compete with the level of dentistry I, I do. Because I do some advanced shit. 
So if they're competing for that, now guess what? We just go turn up the marketing volume. We just go bring in more. Because that's that then becomes a, a true scalable model, which allows us to be even more productive and profitable and whatnot. So anyways, be the associate first. Um, go back to checking, doing good, more hygiene checks, especially new patients. And um, yeah, I hope this was helpful. Uh, make sure you check out um, our mastermind programs. Our mastermind programs start the, uh, the beginning of the year, sometime in January and always sometime again in the second half of the year around July or August. Uh, they run in six month fashions. They're, they're all based around the business of dentistry. You got to be an owner to join them. A lot of it's conversations like these, right? Trying to figure out how do I, how do I scale? How do I replace myself? How do I get more time to do it as the things that I want? Whether that's clinical or with family, et cetera. Um, but take a look at that. And also, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, I think one of the best ways to do that is through our live patient programs with dental implants. So if you're, if you're not placing dental implants or if you have an associate that wants to place dental implants, um, send them our way. 3D dentists, 3D dash dentist.com. All right, everybody have a fantastic rest of your day and work smarter, not harder. Thank you for listening to the millennial dentist. Visit us online at millennialdentist.com. 